Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We do more varieties and flavors of cheese than anywhere else on earth. By pushing the boundaries of what cheese can and should be, find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's our first show of 2022, and we've got a bunch of all-stars. It's January 4th, Tuesday, 2022. Welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. So we started talking about New York City beer bars and uh, New York City distribution, and we've got an interesting group of, of guests today. So let's go around the room and everyone introduce themselves. Let's start with Ken. What's happening, everybody? Ken Landon, I'm the one of the co-owners of Crossroads Brewing Company up in the uh, Hudson Valley of this beautiful state of New York. Great. And Patrick? Uh, my name is Patrick Sylvester. I'm the head brewer up at Crossroads, uh, up at the Catskill location. Great. James? My name is Zinkand. I'm the owner and founder of Misguided Spirits in New York City. Great. And Megan? Uh, my name is Megan Rickerson, and I'm the owner of Someday Bar in Borham Hill, Brooklyn. All right. So, Ken, when you first started talking about this episode with me, we were talking about uh, coming back to New York City, getting distribution. So we, we, I first met 10, 11 years ago. I remember I, I was lucky to carry you at Jimmy's number 43. And what, what happened after a few years? You just decided to focus on, on your own region upstate. As far as what are you saying? As far as like for, distribution, for your you know, distribution and and your product and everything in the in the beginning, or are you talking about right now? Well, like I, I, initially, you you were coming down to the city, right. so just right. give us the back, a little storytelling here. Yeah, so uh, when the okay. first location Athens opened up, that was like back in two thousand and nine, right? Uh, two thousand nine, two thousand and ten. We were only brewing on a seven barrel system, and uh, I think our capacity at that point was like eight hundred barrels. So one of the business plan back then was really to open up our own distribution network and then <clears throat> bring on some other small breweries and then start distribution in the city. Obviously, that never happened. What we did do was is we wound up working with uh, Joe Marino at American Beer at Cobble Hill, Brooklyn. And uh, we were just shipping down as much beer as we possibly could in the, you know, in the very beginning, um, which wasn't much. It was like, I think it was 16 half barrels a month we were sending down sharing cooperage and it just became logistically impossible at that point we were again we were a small brewery and we were selling every drop out of the tap room obviously that's where our margins were so we had to concentrate where our margins were strong but uh <clears throat> you know we also held tight to the self-distribution model as well you know literally just growing organically and grassroots you know one account at a time in our own backyard you know, got it to a point over the course of, you know, 10 years, seven, actually seven, eight years that it was just no longer feasible and logistically possible for me to physically do the self-distribution. So we yeah. moved the, going back back then. So Joe at American, tell us about him and how you met him, because he filled a niche way in the early days of craft beer. He, he was kind of this niche player. Yeah. So Joe, 
Joe Marino was a big player back then. And uh, I, I, before I started Crossroads, I was working at Butternut's Beer and Al, and he was one of the distributors that, that I solicited to, uh, to bring Butternut's on board. Um, you know, at that time, I think he was, he had just brought in Captain Lawrence. He had brought in Blue Point. I think Avery was another one of the brands that he had brought in. But this is going back like it was 2003, I think, 2002, three, four, right around that area when I was with Butternuts. But, uh, you know, it was, again, it was one of those things where Joe was a very honest person. Um, he was very candid with me and very, very honest and just basically said, look, you know, I can, I can bring you to this level, but I'm not going to get you to where you're looking to go, which was, which wasn't my vision. It was Chuck who was the owner of Butternut's vision at that time where he wanted to go. Right. So, you know, we, I was in charge of really, I was still living down in Queens at that time. So I was in charge of going around and really soliciting different distributors and interviewing them and see who we were going to get picked up by. And eventually Butternut signed with, with union. And that's kind of like where I established a lot of those relationships back then in 2004 or five, I still have today that I still talk to, you know, Robert Hodson and, and, and Paul who now have moved up the scale and is vice president and, you know, head head brand manager of the entire Sheehan family operation. So, you know, that's it's going back a long time. But you know, I, I always remember Joe being very honest and open with me, and I just c- kind of held that close to close to my my vest, and, you know, in my in my pocket. And when Crossroads opened, he was the first person I reached out to to really pick his brain and say, "Hey, you know, this distribution shit is really difficult. What do you, you know, I'd like to work with you, but what do I do after that?" So. You know, it was, uh, and we're still battling. Joe, Joe was great. Yeah, he had even like Shelton Brothers. He, he had a lot of, a lot of, uh, I would call him niche distributor. You know, he was kind of the niche distributor before there was a niche. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I eventually sold his entire portfolio over to uh, to Union. You know, and it was a lot of unhappy uh, breweries within that portfolio. And I was one of the, I was the only one because I had such a great relationship with him that he he released us out of our contract and he said, Ken, I know that this is not something that you want to do. So I did not include you in the sale and the purchase and move over to union, you know, um, which was, you know, very admirable. It's funny how things go full circle, you know, not now, now we're like, all right, well, union, you know, looking to talk with union now and I'm still apprehensive about doing that. So, you know, but we do distribute now throughout New York state with craft beer guild. Um, you know, we still handle some of our, 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 our uh, you know, kind of unique self-distribution guys. Um, and, you know, things, things move on. You just, you, you, you move on, but you still like every day, it, it, it's a, it's a complete mess down in the city as far as distribution goes at this point, you know? So half of me is, is kind of happy that I'm there, not really down there as much as we want to be. And the other half is like, well, you know, let's see what the future holds, you know? Yeah. Well, let's, let's go over to James now. So James, tell us a little bit about uh, Misguided Spirits, your background and how, how you started this brand up. So I'm coming from Italy. I opened Italy with Mario and Dogfish and Bureau del Borgo in 2009, 10. Um, went into, you know, running the bar program. We, we did the first New York Spirits bar on the roof at Italy. And then from there, I got into beer a little bit on the brewing end, but they moved me out to Chicago to be head of beer education out there. Um, As we all know, running programs at bars and restaurants and craft beer doesn't pay that well. So I ended up jumping ship um, to a a brand role. I ended up working with um, Miller Coors uh, with Pilsner Kell as one of the ambassadors for the U.S. And then after that, I wanted to go try my hand at more of craft so I went into work for Revolution Brewing. I launched them in New York State um, and then went to go work for Ballast Point. All through the time, I saw where beer was going, um, and I didn't know if I could open a brewery that fulfilled a, a niche. You know, I can make good beer, but I, I just felt like it was a little bit too crowded. And what I found at craft beer bars is that a craft beer bar was likely to bring in a $300 keg, but pour the not, not the best stuff in the well. And so my idea was to create a, a craft well for bars to serve and pour. And as we started to grow, I, I thought about 
what if we changed the model of having a distillery or a brewery and made it employee owned and gave everyone equity in the company um, and then split the profits evenly. And so it's sort of an experiment we're working out. I think the pandemic didn't help our experiment, but you know that's something we're going through right now. I, we finished off this year. I think we sold almost 5,000 cases of beer or booze in the city, which is equivalent to 5,000 barrels. Um, you know, during a pandemic in New York, it's not bad for just starting. So. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about well liquor, I remember that when I first started like 30 years ago, you were very clearly you had the well liquor and you had call liquor. Now, I feel like what you've done is you're branding your well liquor to be a call liquor. Is, is that part of the strategy? Um, and tell okay. us what that means in case people don't know what I'm talking So about. the difference between well liquor and call liquor is, you know, when I ran nightclubs in the city, people don't ask for a certain kind of vodka. They just say vodka. And if they ask for just vodka, you give them the well, which is the house. Um, you're finding that a lot more people, you know, are aware of what they're drinking. So we're just trying to give people a better option in the well. Um, it's starting to become a call at some bars. And then we just picked up a couple big bar groups that are putting it on the menu now. Um, it's growing and we're about to open no, new markets, but we have to figure out like what Ken's going through with upstate New York. We're trying to figure out our city and the Omicron variant has kind of made it very difficult to understand distribution sales and how to approach buyers in a way that's ethical, but also, you know, I'm dealing with a team of seven people in New York City right now. So half of my team, or actually a third of my team is sick. So it's uh, it's a weird time to be doing sales right now down here. Well, on premise for sure. I mean, I, I know that for so many products, whether it was wine, craft beer, spirits, you know, being on premise, being in that restaurant or bar is really the way to put yourself on the map, isn't it? It's a little different than just selling to a retail store. Well, we sit in the bar. We'll sit in a bar for an hour and a half. We'll talk to the customers. We'll let people taste stuff. But if my guys keep getting sick, it just makes me really worried about where the future of sales in uh, this industry are going. Um, and I, I know I can do it. I just want to make sure that I'm not putting anyone in harm's way. I mean, to have a guy out for five days and infect his whole family with kids and then the whole thing, it just, it's... How much is how much is it worth? You know, uh, hey, I'll tell you guys personally. I'm actually going to a funeral after this recording of of a guy who died from COVID, and I actually have to decide: am I going to go to the wake or not? Because his whole family was infected as well, and you start making these choices about what 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 can I do? Um, let's go to Megan. Megan, so for you, like just a little intro from Ken and, and James. I mean, you're you're our indie bar owner, um, so like. How do you interact with these brands? Like, you know, what's a well liquor to you? Um, how how do you take on a new a new craft beer when it's starting up? Well, I think, I mean, you know, we're, this is this conversation is going to be dominated a lot by COVID because <laughs> I think distributing pre COVID and now during COVID and it's like a huge difference, right? Especially with being approached. Um, being approached pre-COVID, everybody's coming at you, they're trying to sell. I think that I've had some like really positive interactions during COVID where um, just the approach is awesome. Um, I know James for a few years now and um, we have a pers personal friendship and a business friendship, but I will say like the way that all of the guys in his company have approached me during the pandemic has been awesome and above reproach where, you know, people are walking into accounts and they're not being like, Hey, we know everybody's struggling, but we'd really like you to take this product on. Like, <laughs> and there have been situations that that has happened where I'm like, buddy, do you, have you, have you turned the news on? Do you see that people are sitting outside and can't come indoors? Um, but I think the city and especially people have really learned that like special nuance of like how to, how to talk to each other. Cause we've all been in it. Um, so I don't know. It's just, this whole community is based on relationships, right? And I've been in beer for, I guess, 13 years in the city. And I buy beer based on my relationships with people. 
Um, obviously, if I get something super cool that comes into the city, I'm going to bring it in because it's going to move. But the relationships I've built within the, the local breweries, like we're very local heavy because those are the people that showed up for us when all this happened. Like the bar was only seven months old when COVID hit. So those breweries that showed up and checked in and weren't like trying to sell beer, but just like, hey, we, we're just making sure you're good. Like those are the people I'm buying from now, honestly. Um, that's how I purchase beer is based on my relationships with people. Yeah. So H- have you noticed are, are people um, have like sales teams cut back? I mean, I know it seemed like in 2020, it seemed like a lot of um, different beverage companies cut their event staff and a lot of their on-premise sales staff. Well, I definitely like within one, one of the bigger distributors, um, I had a specialty rep and then I just had my rep and that doesn't, that is non-existent anymore. I just deal with my, my specialty rep is now my rep. So I don't have two people within one distributor. And that was obviously a larger distributor, but, um, there's definitely been cutbacks. There's also been a lot of shifting within like the industry locally, like people that worked at one brewery that were doing self-distro are now working for a distributor or now somebody's doing that was with the distributor is now doing, you know, a specific brand. So everybody's really stayed, but there's been a ton of, <laughs> I have had to change people's names in my phone. Like so-and-so <laughs> ECBC is now so-and-so, you know, somebody else. And that was just an example. That's not even a thing, but I've had to change the mnemonic devices in my cell phone to remind me where everybody works now because <laughs> there's been such a big shift. So yeah, so 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 with you, like having opened not too long before COVID, you know, and I know you work, you're a real industry veteran, and I know you worked at One Mile House. How, how now? How are you approaching like purchasing? Because purchasing well, is a big part of this industry. Um. Up until, I don't know, December 16th, I was buying like crazy. And then that was the Thursday, the 17th, uh, sales took an absolute jump off of a cliff because of the surge. So I can honestly say that I have not ordered any beer since probably the 20th of December Um, because I was purchasing like we had all of these parties booked, 70 person parties. Um, so I had tons and tons of backup. And then when sales nosedived, I obviously haven't really ordered anything. Um, hopefully when we rebound from this, I try to keep it pretty fair because I love so many people in this industry that I'm like, okay, this week I do this distributor and these two local breweries. Next week I do this distributor and these two local breweries. And I kind of just have it on a rotation and looking like when I've ordered from somebody last um, because you know, we have 17 lines, we have a ton of cans, but you also want to make sure that you're moving through stuff. And I can only have so many hazy IPAs and fruited sours. <laughs> so, and those are the styles that are, that, that crush, but also yeah, you have to make sure do, that they're moving. Do you mind sharing with us, uh, like coming into the holiday season, uh, like maybe two, two beers on draft that you were excited about? Oh God. I love it when I get surprised. My <laughs> brain is like, oatmeal right now um two beers so um been pouring a lot of uh destination unknown recently because i have a really good friend that uh works out there and also also called dubco right dubco Dubco, yeah um so we had their science of selling pina coladas on that just i mean that keg flew It, it was crazy um super juicy, hazy. I'm pretty sure there's, I'm not positive. There's lactose in it. IPA. Um, that keg was gone in like, I don't know, like three days, I think granted at the height of like our party season, but that keg moved. Um, and right now I'm drinking an Imperial stout from fifth hammer because it's only Tuesday and my week has already been brutal. (laughs) Um, (laughs) but it's uh with cacao nibs and orange zest it kind of tastes like do you remember those uh orange candies that you smashed and got the slices do you know what i'm talking about these oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's that's what that reminds me of because i'm a big imperial stout drinker because it's the best bang for your buck wow. when the world is imploding upon itself <laughs> well, so. I, I will say i'm glad you mentioned destination unknown 
just because about five or six years ago, I, I first met them and they really weren't in New York City. But I know that maybe it was last year during the pandemic, they actually mm -hmm. uh, started selling in New York. Yeah. And they're self-distro. And they were only coming down, I think, maybe once a month. Uh, or, and then it was twice a month. And now I think they're doing like once a week. Um, so they're I, they're definitely growing. I know that they kind of, um, they definitely have grown since the pandemic, which is great. And I really like working with them. They're super easy to work with. They're consistent. I like their beers. They're really nice people. Again, that's kind of how I base my ordering. I like people that are nice to me and nice to my bar. And it's easy to sell nice people's beer. You know, oh, this beer is awesome. Also, the owner is a badass. Yay. <laughs> so easy. What what, what so. do you do if someone comes in? Well, this is the old days. Someone come in with it with a strange uh, Amaro or like a weird vermouth or something and offer you money to carry it, even though you know you'll never sell it. <laughs> I love Amaro, so I will sell okay. <laughs> it. <laughs> That's not a problem. Amaro and whiskey are like my go-tos. So um, we actually move a lot of Amaro in the bar because it's a bartender shot. You know, everyone's like, oh, Fernet's a bartender shot. Well, Fernet is an Amaro. I don't actually really like Fernet. Um, I like other Amaros, so it's super easy for me. To yeah, move. that's the whole funny thing is why Fernet became the bartender's Amaro. But there's, it's probably because there weren't that many other Amaros. Hey, if it's, it's, it's New Year now. Let's just let's lighten this up. So say it's New Year's and, and it's I'm at Sunday Bar. And you're going to make a, a drink with an Amaro and a misguided spirit. <laughs> what what would you make? I'm, I know, I'm putting you on the spot. Again, you're really good at this. Because you're good, that's why. James is like leaning in. He's like, here, James, <laughs> you jumped in on this. It's, it's New Year's Eve at, at Sunday Bar, and we have an Amaro. I think we're just doing I mean, shots of whiskey. <laughs> so I will say, James um, kept me going through this pandemic by supporting me with his rye whiskey because um, it's my favorite and it's, I'm not even bullshitting. It's literally what I drink. It's what it's on our menu in our old fashioned. Um, it's so good. So I drink his whiskey a ton. I'm not a huge gin or vodka drinker. I'm super excited for your rum to come out because I tried it. Oh, and, you did. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Anzalone. Yeah, and, good. uh, and I'm excited for the tequila because the summertime I'm a tequila drinker. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go to James with this on this cocktail because I'm like we just do shots at misguided. Um it's kind of like our go-to with pairing with beer. Uh for us, we don't want to take away from craft beer. And I feel like shots just complement a beer. Um, and that's kind of why we made our company. Um, is we just want boiler makers essentially. Um, and I am a craft beer person at, at heart. So when I started Misguided Spirits, it was not necessarily to be like a cocktail product. It was mainly to be like a beer shot combo. Yeah. And that's how we kind of roll with it. Well, that, that's how I drink. You know, I, I, I personally like to have a beer and then I have like a nice sip of, of, of a good spirit. And um, that's that's nice to know. We're kindred spirits. She should mention Mike Anzalone. So who else is working with you? So I have uh, Sean, Sean Graves from Buffalo Trace. I have Josh Grisby from Collective Arts. Um, and when I say I have, I mean, we're partners. So um, I have Will Turbert, who was the manager for um, Manhattan Beer for Brooklyn. Um, I have my kid sister. We hired her on to do social with an agency that we have called Good Vines. Uh, we have JVS, who's we share with that. He's our uh, crossroads just, uh, rep and misguided rep. So that's how many and Ken know each other. Um, so JVS covers from Westchester to Canada. And then we have uh, Nico, who's the founder of Lockhouse in Buffalo. And then I think that's everyone. Yeah, there's a lot of us now. So you're you're on to something. So Ken, what what? How did you and uh, James end up with the same distributor? And just tell us about how that works. Are, are, are we selling sh uh, shots of misguided next to next to pints and crossroads everywhere? No, it just happened. I, honestly, this is the first time I'm actually meeting uh, James face to well Zoom to <laughs> Zoom. We actually haven't <laughs> met each other. I met uh, who did I meet? Mike, right? Uh, was it Mike at a, at a year camp uh, down in the city Matt, about a month ago? Mike, yep. Mike Anzalone, Mike, yeah, great Mike, right. Guy, right? But I mean, uh, you know, it just we we share like 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 you said, James said, 
we share the same uh, split rep, which is a new model that uh, uh, Craft Beer Guild is 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 kind of like mirroring from Union, right? So the split rep essentially rep reps uh, Crossroads, Misguided, and a cider company, and you know just just through that we've kind of been texting and talking, and we actually the only spirits that I carry in our Athens restaurant is Misguided, so we created a menu around you know the Misguided uh, spirits which has been great for us. Um, you know, it's doing very, very well. So we just thought it was a no brainer. You know, um, we never, we never, we, although we carried a full liquor license for the full 10 years that we've been open at the restaurant, we've never brought in liquor before. We only did beer and wine. I only carried the liquor just in case we ever needed to bring in liquor. And obviously now our, our MO is, is to create as many revenue streams as we possibly can because the pandemic is just crushing us. So we decided to bring in, the spirit end of it and uh we just brought in the misguided so that's kind of like aside from that we just kind of fell into it you know just meeting each other you guys with that with that craft beer guild that's that's from westchester up to the canadian border yeah they run yeah westchester canadian border and just slightly west uh of albany i don't know how far out they go i think it's a good uh, program I think what happens in these smaller areas is you don't have for brands like me and Ken's, you don't have a rep that can cover that amount of territory. And so if we can come together and split, split a rep and we also don't have budgets to pay people, you know, a ton of money. So if we can share the cost together through the distributor, it kind of helps. Yeah. So So how does it work? You guys, you each pay the, the rep or you share it with the distributor. So I, I, I honestly don't even know how it works. No, no, no. So it's a, each guy, each, figuring it out. each brand pays a third. The way that we try to quantify it is like, we knew that, you know, we know how much we need to sell in that territory to pay for that person or a third of that person. And whether he's going to sell it or we're going to bring up eight guys to sell it, uh, we're going to do it ourselves to make sure that it's viable um, because we do think there is a market up uh, in upstate New York for misguided spirits. And in fact, for, you know, we do conferences in the region. There's more, it's easier to do business in upstate New York because people aren't asking for money. Uh, when you come down to the city, it's very cost intensive to deal with a lot of these bar groups, uh, whether it's 10,000 here or 5,000, you know, people, I have no qualms asking you for $10,000 placement at Marquee or Lavo or some of these big nightclubs. But if I go up to state New York, I can get four or five bar groups with not a lot of money, but base it off a personal relationship rather than a cash relationship, which is down the city. It's a little bit different up there. I like it a lot. Uh, we're crossing into territory. Let's um, let's switch over to Patrick. <laughs> Patrick, t- tell us about the, a beer that you, you 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 mentioned, your new IPA. Oh sure, yeah. So switch it up. We're drinking um, Audacity. It's our new cold IPA, um, which has been kind of a you know a newer uh, hype style beer for sure. That's been coming on. Uh, a lot of people roll their eyes when they tell me you know when I tell them I made a cold IPA, but I really like it. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a refreshing kick away from uh, the hazy, hazy beers that we've been having for the last decade or so, where this beer is brewed with lager yeast. It's different than an IPL. Uh, so it's a lager yeast at warm temperatures. So it's the same two week time frame on the nail. Uh, it gives you a nice, clean, crisp finish, just like a lager does, but you're allowed to still do uh, the IPA kind of dry hopping techniques that we've come to love with all the hazies. Uh, which kind of gives you this oxymoron of a beer where it's very, uh, it's crystal clear. I run it through the center for you. It's crystal clear. doesn't have wheat or oats or anything like that, but it has this big hot presence, big nose to it. Um, and just personally, I mean, it was fun for me to brew because that's where my palate has gone over the years of just drinking, you know, endless amounts of beer. You know, you're drinking Notch tonight. You know, the lager drinker will come back to all of us, I think, at some point when your palate just gets fatigued. And this was a nice, uh, you know, middle point of where you can get the hop flavor, you get that hop little, you know, twist on it, uh, but still get that kind of all day drinking vibe that a lager will give. Um, so this guy's done with Centennial Amarillo Mosaic, 
and uh, El Dorado hops. Wow. Patrick, how, how long have you been brewing at Crossroads? Uh, I've been brewing at Crossroads since 2019, and I've been brewing in general. I brewed at Keegan Ales with Tommy uh, since 2012. So I've been brewing for like 10 years now. So, so just in that region, how, how have... How how has IPA evolved for you as a brewer? Like, oh my god, it's been it's been wild. <laughs> so so you know, I mean, when you especially you know, I remember making Hurricane Kitty, which was an IPA made with Crystal Sixty malt, which made it <laughs> you know amber in color and similar to like Arrogant Bastard, and it's like that's unheard of at this point. I remember delivering kegs to the guys at Sloop when Sloop was run out of their uh, garage and he was, you know, running a hose to his <laughs> basement to transfer the beer down over there. Um, so it's just, it's been, you know, it's been crazy. It's been the IPA category in general uh, has thrown a lot of curveballs because they're expensive. They're, you know, the shortest lifespan of anything else. There's a lot of hiccups that can go along the way. So you have to appreciate the people that can make them consistently and make them, um, you know, approachable and then shelf stable and be able to be served at a bar like someday and, and be able to guarantee that you have a clean keg of hazy beer that's coming through. Um, so there's, you know, in terms of brewing on the brewing side, there's a lot to it. They give me the most headache um, and we do a lot of contract brewing and I, have to guarantee that this hazy beer is going to stay hazy. It's going to stay hop forward and it's going to stay aromatic for the entire time. And that's a difficult, difficult task. That's a tall order for sure. Um, so it's pretty crazy to see where it's come, um, you know, through and through. Wow. Well, I'll tell you guys, we're after a great start. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Wisconsin, the state of cheese, makes half of the nation's specialty cheese and wins more awards than any other state or country. Our heritage and traditions, master cheesemaker program, and the American propensity for innovation all put Wisconsin on the cutting wedge of cheesemaking. With over 600 varieties of cheese to choose from and 5,500 national and international awards and counting, get ready to turn your refrigerator into a trophy case. Enjoying a Wisconsin cheese is basically like winning a gold medal in culinary achievement. Set your mind at cheese. When you bite into a wedge of Wisconsin Wonderful, you know it is made with the ultimate skill and passion possible. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Become a member and support us at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. All right, we're talking about all kinds of things, but it's the first show of the year, 2022. We've got Crossroads Brewing, Misguided Spirits, and Someday Bar in Brooklyn. Um, Patrick was just talking about IPAs. Um, Megan, you know, your background, I know you worked at One Mile House. Um, how, how do spirits and, and beer go together for you at Sunday Bar? You know, uh, I worked at One Mile under Jerry, who is, you know, the reason that I have everything that I have. I learned everything from him and especially beer. Um, but we were high volume because we were next to the Bowery Ballroom. So there wasn't like a huge, we had a you know, a specialty cocktail menu, but it wasn't this huge emphasis. It was a lot of like vodka sodas and whiskey gingers, especially during those like pre-concert hits. So when we moved over here, Borm Hill, um, it's different. It's not the Lower East Side. You know, we definitely still do our fair share of vodka sodas, but like people want something more curated. I mean, we're around the corner from, you know, this craft cocktail bar called Grand Army. So we're not going to be Grand Army, but we still have to have, you know, something, something that jumps off from that. Right. Um, and I think a thing we really focused on during the pandemic when we could do to go liquor were the classics because everybody needed, um, 
comfort and reassurance and something that they recognized. And so when it came to cocktails, we really focused on old fashions and Manhattans and Negronis. And honestly, they crushed. And it's really easy to do a classic the right way, but it's also really easy to do classics the wrong way. Um, so we turned into more of a cocktail bar than I ever expected, especially with the 120 cans that we sell for in-house and to go, the 17 lines. I had 20 lines. I converted one of them for wine because we were doing froze <laughs> and I was throwing away six bottles, like glass bottles of, of rosé, putting them into the frozen machine, which seemed wasteful. So I was like, well, I'm going to get a kegged rosé. Um, so I'm not just destroying glass and throwing so much away. And um, it was it was more cost effective. And then we switched two of our lines to cocktails. When we opened, if you would have asked me if I ever would have done a draft cocktail or wine, I'd be like, no, we're a beer bar. Like we are a beer bar. We're going to have 20 lines and that's that. Um, so a lot has changed. And I think we, as everybody in this group understands, we've had to, you know, roll with the punches and change to maybe not what we thought we were going to be, but to what people need and what, and you know, what COVID has created this world for us to be in. Um, so we do probably just as much beer as we do liquor now, which I never would have thought would be the thing. Um, we still do a lot of beer, but we do a lot of liquor too. And, and that was a thing that I've learned too, is um, I always did beer events and tap takeovers. So all of a sudden I have liquor distributors and people that work for different liquor brands walking in, wanting to talk to me. And I'm like, you want to have a tap takeover? Oh, wait, this is, not the same thing. this is not the same thing. Um, so that was a huge learning curve for me too. Cause that's what I was a beer girl, a beer girl that could swing booze really quickly if I had to in high volume. Um, but it's been fun too. learning. I've had to do a lot of self-teaching about a lot of stuff that I probably wouldn't have had to without the pandemic. If we're looking for a silver lining, which no. no, you yeah. you keep rolling, Megan, because um, I think I was lucky I got to talk to you last year um, about women in beer and during New York City Beer Week. But w what's an example of of how you had to pivot to interact with the spirits rep since we're talking about distribution? Like what what if, what if, what do you now do at your bar that you never would have thought of doing before? Well, I mean, top takeovers are kind of easy, right? You're like, OK, I'm going to put these six or ten or however many lines on but also once those kegs are gone there's probably a very good possibility that most of those kegs are like you know one-off batches or something that's not going to come around all the time or it's seasonal or you know what I'm saying like those beers aren't going to come back there's no okay I have to keep this line on also we've never been that kind of bar like we don't have a lot of mainstays we have a couple of loggers that we keep on pretty consistently because our regulars like them and know them and you know, in our neighborhood, we also have to cater to a group of people that are not craft beer focused. Um, so we keep those, you know, couple lines that makes it approachable for people that aren't looking for a 12% Imperial Stout, a hazy IPA, a fruit of sour, uh -huh. you know, you have to, you have to cater to everybody, especially right now. Um, whereas liquor, things are different. Like people want to be on your cocktail menu. Um, people want things like that. Like, okay, can, can we be on your spring list or can we be on your fall list? And, you know, before I never had that, it was like, okay, I'm going to create a cocktail menu and I drink a lot of Elijah Craig. So it makes sense. I'm just going to throw <laughs> Elijah Craig on my cocktail menu. And so that's where it's kind of differed. Um, where it's people are kind of vying to be on like a spring or summer cocktail list. And that was new. That was new for me. I was just like, oh, okay. Because they want they want volume, whereas craft beer they're like we want to do a tap takeover, you know. But we don't do line commitments at my bar, so there's no like I'm going to guarantee you, you know, so and so brewery to be on my lot this line for the entire year. That's where it kind of differs, I think, with alcohol, with liquor yeah. and beer. Well, you, In craft, you're, beer you're great. World. You could be coaching at any any up and coming liquor or beer salesperson. So this is no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. All right, and, and Kenny, so. Let's get back to you. So when I first met you, you were you were 
self-distributing. You were distributing through American beer way back 10, 12 years ago. And at some point you told me that, did you just get so busy selling out of, out of your, your tap room and, and an upstate that you weren't really trying to sell in the city? Maybe this is four or five years ago. Yeah. I mean, you got to sit there and really figure out what your end game is going to be. Right. Um, and I think that, that, at the end of the day, the decision was made to be really focused and really strong in your own backyard, right? Um, and then branch out from there. As much as I always entertain the fact, look, I'm from the city, right? I'm from Queens. I got a lot of connections down there. I mean, I was bringing beer to drop-off service and Blind Tiger and Jimmy's 43 and, and, and uh, you know, the uh, Rudy's and Collins Bar and you know those yeah. bars, you know back in the day I, I have a lot of a lot of relationships at you know uh, Pony Bar and whatnot we can go on and on, <clears throat> um, but you know it's it's you got to be careful what you wish for you know I know how volatile it is down there and you know I, I can I can almost hear it in you know Megan's voice you know, when she's saying that the, the what she's up against purchasing beers purchasing liquor and doing all of those things. And I, I really think it's fantastic, you know, uh, relationship wise. And that's what things are coming down to now, networking relationship wise, who, who, who's taking care of me. I'm going to take care of them. It's really, really important. And, you know, I just thought that if we look, if we can't be strong in our own backyard, what really gives us the right to go somewhere else and try and be strong? You know what I mean? Um, you know, we do small distribution in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We were in Connecticut. We were out in Western New York. And, you know, those relationships fall apart. And, uh, again, it all focuses, it goes back to, but you, you got to be strong right here, you know. Um, and there's plenty of growth potential and opportunities right here. You know, it's kind of like, uh, look, we were in Madison Square Garden at one point, right? Was it great? Of course. I mean, we were in the Delta Suites. We had our style. We had Madison Square Garden logo on our cans. It was all great. But at the end of the day, you got to make money, right? Uh, you know, I got into it for the passion and the love of it. But as soon as all of that, as soon as reality sets in and you realize, wow, you got to still pay bills too. You know, you got to you got to focus on your margins and you got to focus where you're, you're strongest. And uh, that was just, just kind of our mindset. You know, we dabble. We get some beer down into the city every now and again. We send some stuff to Queens, some Long Island here and there. But our main focus right now is our own backyard and creating, you know, some more growth and opportunities right within manageable distances. So that's kind of like where that all came from. And then uh, back to James. James, I just want to go back to this call versus well again, because, um, you know, 30 years ago, it it really was that the, the well liquor was just, the cheapest, you know, random brand that, that you would get from the distributor. It's, it still is <laughs> <laughs> like, don't let it, it still is. Um, and I think I'm trying to, it's, you know, what craft beer went through when I was at Italy in 2010, you had, um, you know, people didn't know what an IPA was or, you know, he had to educate them. Um, I think there's a lot of education that can happen around, Listen, you don't have to change the wheel uh, with what is a house pour. We just want to make it better and we want to make it equitable. And I think you can do this for anything in the bar. I think that the way that we look at beverage in the United States needs to be equitable to the people that sell it. And it's not happening. And I think there has to be an energy where people, it's not socialism, but I think it's a new way to run a company where everyone is an owner and a partner. Um, and I think that gives a story that makes people bond to the brand that makes it become a call. But right now we're just a well, um, and we're figuring it out. So but it's um, a well that you call. Well, it's a well that you can call. Yeah, for sure. Same as guided, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and Megan's but putting we, you on her list. But we have what we're about to have five SKUs, you know, five different, you know, products. Uh, we're going to add a sixth and a seventh. I have wine coming in from Argentina right now. Uh, so you're going to have misguided vines. Um, it's going to get pretty heady. So <laughs> we just want to be the house red. <laughs> like, I don't want to, like, just when you say red wine, it's red wine, you know, like whatever. All right. So, so. so you're, you're bringing in, right, let's do this shot and a beer. So I got rye whiskey. Yeah. Neat. I like to say neat instead of shot. What beer do you drink it with? 
I'm doing a, a lager, easy lager, something very simple. Um, I made that rye whiskey because I used to be a regular at the Double Down Saloon, um, which is down the East Village. And the house pour tastes like burnt popcorn. <laughs> and I just wanted to make a shot of whiskey that went well with uh, like a really crappy paps. And that's uh, yeah. that's what it's for, you know? It's, a all, it's an all-day so What about when yeah. you roll out your rum? So, what would you pair that with? Well... Rum for me is probably going to be like a really rich brown ale or a stout. Um, the rum that we are coming out with, we're the first uh, spirits company to blend rum with sea salt. Um, so we got a four-year Panamanian rum with sea salt, and it's uh, it's really good. It's shockingly good. I don't so, drink rum, yeah. just so we're clear. And I tried the rum, and it is really good. And I was like, yeah, I don't good. like rum. <laughs> I like their rum. But but this energy, I think, you know, with spirits and what's happening, I think, you know, the people can enjoy your house spirit. I think it only complements the craft beer that you're serving too. I think that we put a lot of energy into craft beer and can you make a great product, right? So I'm only trying to complement these craft breweries, you know, right next to you guys. I'm not trying to, I want to live in the same space, but at the same time too, in a craft beer bar, I kind of just, I want to have that same energy that you guys already put out in the universe. And I don't think a lot of well brands are doing that at all, or, you know, some of the lower end ones. I don't think they're looking at this as a, like a, a proposition for craft beer bars. So, so what, what about if someone's at a, at a bar and, and someone says, I want a Tito's soda. And they say, oh, we have something just like it. And they just pour a well. Uh, it's not. I mean, you can more than happy to pour my stuff. But I mean, I used to run a bar program. I would not, I hate saying this, but I wouldn't have a bar without Tito's, to be honest. It's just easy money, right? If you're more than happy to pour my stuff and let them try it. But it's all about giving a customer what they want right now, too, right? So can I jump in on this? When it comes, yeah, so go for it. We're out of Tito's, right? Right now, currently, because distributing and ordering and cluster fuck of the world. Um, and when someone asks, and it's two days after New Year's. So, um, when someone asks for Tito's, I go, I'm really sorry, we're out. I have something comparable and it's local. Who do you think I'm pouring? You're local. So, like, and people have had no issue with it. When we're talking, I wouldn't, with the way you said it, you're like, I know that you're the well brand, but I wouldn't do it that way. I mean, everyone does it differently, but I have something, something just as good and local instead of being like, well, I have this awesome well. Like, yeah. No, for sure. But uh, when we go in and we approach buyers and we talk about uh, how to sell, and this goes when I was selling beer too, understanding what you have in your lane Right. So I understand that I started a company that is targeting well, we can be a call. Um, but I know that I don't have enough brand equity with a consumer to validate going in with this energy and gusto. Well, I think it was more at Jimmy, what I know, I know that you know exactly your identity is yours and you know it. I think it was more when he was like he was saying, you know, how would you kind of sell this? And I'm like, I think that comes down yeah, to yeah. the bartenders. And the staff. Yeah. Well, For that's sure. actually where, that's yeah. why I mentioned Tito's because I, I wanted to bring that up that, you know, I feel that Tito's, I can say this, I think that, and having known them a long time, they did a great job of elevating what could have been a well brand to a call. And now it's kind of ubiquitous and, and that's great for them and everyone loves it. But um, I did think that was worth worthy part of the conversation because I think that's about part of breaking in as, as a new spirit, the same way that perhaps years ago, craft beers had to nudge their way into an old school bar, you know, versus another mainstream. Well, I think with craft beer, it was, you know, what we're finding too, is like Megan said, it's bartenders really getting around, you know, when the New York craft beer guild did all that stuff where, you know, they brought everyone together and they did the Firkin events um, it really got everyone involved and in tasting the beer and enjoying the people that were behind the beer. And you got that energy when you went to craft beer bars and that's how craft beer is sold and was sold, you know, it was that energy behind the people serving the beer. And I think you're finding that a little bit with, uh, spirits as well, but for beer, it's really important. 
um, for the establishments and the bartenders to really get behind the product that's selling. You know, that's how you're going to sell the most beer. And then, and Kenny, what about you? So anything to add to this? Because we're going to wrap it up soon. Oh, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I feel the same way about all of it. I think the big challenge is that to, to look, it's always been the bartenders to, to really get behind the product and push it. Right. We're all feeling the staff shortages and, and, you know, the challenges and, you know, nowadays, I think a lot of the things fall by the wayside as far as educating the consumer, you know, um, I know me and Patrick have these conversations every single day. You know, I think the days of, um, you know, it's always what's new. Um, you know, the, the, I, I, I think there was a time when there, the $12.99 lager pack was going to be, <clears throat> you know, the better choice over the $14.99 four pack of the, you know, the, the hazies. But these days now, I think it's just lawlessness out there. I think people just, it, it's just like, you know, I know prices are getting raised. I see stuff $17.99. You know, fourteen ninety nine. Whether it's a lager, whether it's a sour, whether it's a an age barrel age, it's just there's no rhyme or reason. And you know, I've been doing this a long, long time. I've never seen anything like this before. So, if I can get a bartender behind my my you know my beers in a bar, that's that's astonishing to to say the least. If I can get a a, a permanent tap line in a bar in this climate. I'm going to bend over backwards and do everything I possibly can to make sure that they're taken care of, you know, and that all comes down to building the relationships and making sure that you're taking care of that bar, you know, but, uh, so will you, will you go back? Let's say I was pouring your, pouring your one of your beers and you didn't think it was coming out right. Would you actually go back and check the keg and, and look at the system and make sure oh, it was absolutely. I do pouring right? I'm not. I get calls constantly, you know, just like, Hey, you know, this is, this is wrong. It, you know, and then if it gets into technical stuff, you know, and then Patrick is is, is always there to to. Uh, yeah, you know, let's not let's not throw the word constantly. It doesn't happen that often. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm not I'm not sure I really like that word that we used. Yeah, it happens sometimes for sure, and a lot of times it's not our fault. But yeah, no, I mean that's true. You know, that there's a there's a quality aspect that needs to be maintained now. I think for sure. And more now, more than ever, listen, like bars are strapped on a budget. Breweries are strapped on a budget. You just can't have somebody calling up and saying they just bought a keg. That's the people aren't liking. Like you, you can't, your margin of error has gotten so narrow between competition, between, you know, financial problems, shortages and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a pretty rough world to be a part of right now. And, you know, um, some of these new guys that are coming in and trying to figure it out, it's, it's, it's not a great climate for people to come, you know, that are wet behind the ears for sure. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's, um, let's all just say what we're drinking. I'll start with me. So I'm North of Boston today. I'm drinking Notch Session Pills. It's a Czech, Czech style pill lager. Really into the, really into Notch and Chris Lauren. Megan, I saw you had a can. What do you have? Yeah, this is the the fifth hammer um, delay pedal. It's the imperial stout with the cacao nibs and the orange zest, like that Easter candy. That I like. Beautiful, uh, Patrick. Beer, one of your uh, beers you want to recommend again? I'm drinking the Audacity Cold IPA. You know, something switching it up, nice hop aroma, good and clean. Great, and Kenny. I'm drinking. I was I was drinking the same. <laughs> you guys, you guys are united front. I love that. And hey, James, man. what? I'm not. I'm I'm dry. You're rye whiskey, right now. You're rye whiskey bro. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for chatting, man. And I didn't get a chance to really congratulate Megan. Um, she's been the during the pandemic the voice of indie bars. And um, congrats on being part of the board for the New York City Hospitality Alliance nice. that Very I nice. um, really respect. And throughout the pandemic and before. I, I take their their guidance on everything and um, big shout out to Andrew Ritchie. So um, you're in great company, Megan. Hey, uh, hey, Jimmy, we still got two minutes left or are we still? Yeah. I, I, I wanted one of the one of the big things I wanted Patrick to just touch on this collaboration that we're doing in, in Brooklyn. And, and maybe, you know, Megan and James might even want to kind of like get some interest in this with Sure Thing. And Patrick knows more about it. But uh, 
Yeah, if, if, we, cool thing. if we got some time on it, but I mean, it kind of goes in all the spirit of everything that we've been talking about of um, people struggling and, you know, trying to highlight the people that are doing their best and maybe that aren't getting the, the center stage that they want, but we're partnering up with a good buddy of mine. He's actually my best friend from high school, uh, works with a company called, uh, or actually started his own company called Sure Thing. Uh, where it's like sort of like an artist platform where you used to highlight creative people um, and try and bring their artwork or, you know, whatever they're doing out to the focus. Uh, and so we partnered up, we're making a beer and we're partnered up with four different artists. We have two photographers, an illustrator and a painter. Uh, we're going to kind of do what kind of similar to collective arts, we'll come out with a four pack that has a, uh, you know, a little, uh, their artwork on it and trying to remember people that like, you know, these people, you know, you think your job was tough during the COVID. I mean, art was something that got pushed to the back burner for sure. You know, being, um, you know, it, they, they didn't have an outlet when everybody was stuck in their own homes. So we kind of want to use our platform as best as we can, uh, to go ahead and put it forward. So we'll have a four pack with four different art, pieces of artwork on it, little bio on it. The beer will be like a rustic lager, um, something crushable and approachable. Um, but just kind of, you know, crossroads part in taking a step forward, you know, for 2022 to try and get, get the hell out of 2021 and 2020 um, and try and help everybody to come on with it for sure. Great. Well, listen, you guys keep us posted <clears throat> and, you know, just keep tagging us at beer underscore sessions on Instagram. And we'll repost stuff. Megan, I cut you off, but um, congrats again. And thanks so much for coming on again, being a voice of indie beer bars and bars. James Zinkin, congrats on Misguided Spirits and good luck. And uh, hopefully 2022, get more on-premise placements. Ken and Patrick, so great talking to you guys. Um, we will be back, all right? So thanks to Armin, our engineer. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here on Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time. All right. Woo. Thank Check you. us out. Heritage Radio Network. Okay. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio is supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.